and and it was just silent. And in that silence, there was the loudest ringing in my head that I'd ever heard in my life, talking to my wife, and I just screamed as loud as I could. So after you started rapping uh, in about 2014, mm-hmm. a tragedy happened to your family. Mm-hmm. Can you describe that for yeah, us? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in um, in 2013, a um, a show that I had, um, I had a couple shows back to back. So I flew out to go to these events, but. Um, um, while I'm gone, I'm just calling home to check on the family. And um, I get a, a call from my wife and she's like, hey, uh, my son Chase, Chase isn't doing well. Um, so we went to the, the ER. I was like, wait, the ER, why? Well, his temperature was high. We don't know what's going on. I say, okay, well, let me know what's going on. Uh, and that was late, you know, Saturday night um, <clears throat> um, or Friday night. I'm sorry. I get a call Saturday and he's fine. Everything's great. He's cooing in the back and saying dad, dad, and doing all the normal stuff. And so I go through Saturday, Saturday night, call home, talk, pray, go to sleep, wake up Sunday, um, text. It's super early, like, hey, headed to the airport, get a text, cool, all, all's good. Um, I get on the plane, take off, I land, and I have a voicemail. And I go, well, it's from my wife, I'll just call, I won't listen to it. And I call her instead, and when she picks up on the other end, um, she, she says he didn't make it. Um, and in her context, it made sense. But for me, I'm going, what? Who didn't? Like, I thought Ashley was picking me up from the airport. What do you mean they didn't make it? No, Chase didn't make it. Make what? What are you talking about? And then she says it again and it clicks. Um, and in that moment, you know, when you, if you've ever taken a flight, you fly in, you land, and they kind of announce we're here, so forth and so on. And it, then it just goes really quiet on a plane. There's not a lot of noise from the engine. There's not a lot of people talking. Um, and and it was just silent. And in that silence, there was the loudest ringing in my head that I'd ever heard in my life, talking to my wife. And I just screamed as loud as I could. Um, and there was this moment of disbelief, shock. It can't be true, but she said it was. And then the the onset of emotions, a flurry of emotions that just um, kept going back and forth to hear that my son had passed away. Um, and so, man, I just, I, I hit the wall, <laughs> literally, like punched the wall, um, stood up. The lady, uh, I terrified everybody on the plane. The flight attendant was, you know, normally tell you to stay seated, but she didn't say anything. She just watched me. <clears throat> the woman next to me, I tried to share the gospel with her on the plane, and we got up to the point of talking about faith. And I, and I didn't know why God wanted me to do that, but when we landed, she just started rubbing my back. And, and she's an older lady, and she started rubbing my back and saying, just have faith. Remember, just have faith. And she didn't know anything that was going on, um, but that was enough to calm me down. I got off the plane, and the rest of it was really a blur until I got home and saw my wife. Um, and we kind of met in the middle of the room, collapsed, and we cried. And, I mean, we were there probably 10 minutes before somebody helped us up. And then I happened to notice, oh, there's other people here, and my pastor was there and different friends. Um, and we went in the room, and... We were there for three days. We didn't leave the room. We just prayed, cried, slept, prayed, cried, slept, talked, looked at pictures, laughed, cried, went to sleep. Um, and it's true what people say. You know, eventually people stopped coming. They stopped calling. Um, it was really quiet in the house. Um, <clears throat> but I think for both of us, um, we had an older son, Jaden. At the time, he was three. And Jaden was um, about to be four. And Jaden was the sense of normalcy for us. He was still a kid, still had to wake up, eat, play, laugh, go outside, take a nap, still had to um, be a kid in in a real way. And so for me, he was my... um, he was my um, point of reality. You realize I can't just check out. 
as much as I want to. And for a time I did, but, but you can't just check out cause he's here. Um, and eventually well, I can't just check out cause she's here and we got to figure this out. So thus began the journey and the new normal. When you say check out, you mentioned for <clears throat> the time you did, um, what were some of the unhealthy ways that you coped with the tragedy? Uh, I, everything got dark at one point. I think for me, I started out like a Martha, you know, Lazarus dies and Martha's busy attending to different things and tasks and people. And, you know, she's trying to honor her brother through service maybe, or honor people because they're here to love her brother and, you know, the family, whatever she was doing. Um, I took on that role, that mentality. Let me make sure the bills are paid and that everybody's taken care of and family's good. And, you know, I'm going to handle the business and I'm going to be helpful. Um, and I had a good six months of that before um, the bottom fell out and I didn't have that energy anymore. Uh, and then eventually, three months later, I didn't have that desire. The desire was there at one point, but the energy was gone. And eventually the, the desire was gone fully. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. And eventually <clears throat> it, hit, it hit home. He's not coming back. This, like he's gone for real. And in that moment, um, people in general, but especially guys, in my opinion, you have the choice to either be constructive or destructive. Um, and I chose to be destructive. And so the initial response was, I just need to escape. I need to get away. Um, and so I would get away by going to hang with friends and just being gone all day or um, just randomly leaving and going back to Houston from Dallas just to go see friends and family because I needed something different than what I was. And, or I would, um, go with my buddy who I worked with at the gym. We'd work out together. Um, and I would go with him and we sit at a bar all day. Or I would go hang out with kids that I knew who were in the inner city that I was trying to reach and just kind of be in their mix. I wasn't necessarily doing what they were doing, but just wanted to be around a different element. And eventually what I realized is I, I didn't want to be me. Being me wasn't fun, it wasn't, wasn't good. Um, statistically speaking, um, I should have been divorced, no family, and probably way worse off than I was in that moment. And so the odds were against me and I wasn't really ready to fight those odds. Um, so eventually I just started to escape more. I didn't want to be myself. And I would think often, well, if I just leave and go somewhere else, I can start a new life and I can just be someone different. Cause this guy, it's, it's hard, it hurts. It's it's not easy being where I am. Um, and so when I talk about my son being a sense of normalcy, it was always a snap back to reality of you're tripping. Like, look at what you got. Don't, don't give that up. Don't throw that away. Um, but that wasn't easy. I mean, there was fights with my wife and arguments and talks of leaving and man, I want to quit. I want to give up. And this isn't fun. And man, you're not supporting me the way I thought you would. And she's like, you're not here the way I thought you were, would be. And, I need you. Well, I need you too. And we're kind of missing one another. Um, and eventually I was like, enough's enough. I don't care anymore. Um, and so in this season reach is like my label is like, Hey, take all the time you need. You're good. You don't have to do music. You don't have to do anything. So I was like, well, I'm done being me. Whoever Tadashi is, that person doesn't exist anymore. I'm going to do what I want to do. Um, so if, it, if I weren't drinking, I was smoking. If I wasn't smoking, um, I was, experimenting, just wanting to go numb. I tried to numb myself as much as I could. Um, and if nothing else, like even though those things happened, the worst drug of all was food. Um, food is readily available and it's comforting, especially in the South. And so it was me, food, TV, and I would snap at anybody who wanted to interrupt my, my comfort. And comfort became the idol more so than anything else um, because if I can't leave this life, then I need to make it as comfortable as possible until I'm done with it. Um, and in that moment, friends lovingly started to push me toward therapy, counseling. Um, so me and my wife started going to marriage counseling. And um, eventually it was grief counseling, but the guy was honest. He was like, my goal is to keep you together. Um, Satan's goal is to tear you apart. So we're gonna fight the enemy here. Um, and we fought to stay married. And then I would go home and see my son and the joy of being with him was not necessarily a replacement for what I lost, um, 
but it was just sweet. So after that, how did it go in uh, therapy, therapy and marriage counseling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what was, how long did that take to kind of start to heal things? So we were in counseling for almost a year, um, right under a year. And then it, it went to um, individual counseling and I went by myself. Um, <clears throat> starting off, it was weird. <laughs> I'm just going to sit in here and talk to you, I guess, sir. I mean, we know you, but it's weird. It was, if I assumed it was going to feel like a small group moment, but it didn't. It felt way more um, intrusive. Which, which made me judge my small group a little bit. But I was like, yeah, I think, I think he's prying in ways that people haven't, um, which is good for us, but difficult to, to do initially. And eventually we got to this place where there was a rapport, um, a depth in the relationship, and, and then honest communication with him and then between she and I. Um, and a lot, of it, a lot of it began to be therapeutic for me um, just to have a safe outlet. I, I wouldn't say that healing necessarily fully took place in that year, but an, a safe outlet brought a sense of a care that I didn't have. Um, the church we were at, I mean, the guy was a shepherd. I, I, he was a rare breed, amazing. And so I could easily walk with him and talk, um, but he didn't have the the bandwidth to do what this guy was doing specifically. So it was just beautiful to get to the end of it and realize, all right, so I need more help, but just me. And so I would meet with him again for another three months. And then he would kind of push me out and go, all right, go live. And if you need time again, let's come back in a couple of months and reconvene and see what's up. Um, but probably a, a year or so later, we ended up moving to Atlanta. So we left Dallas, moved to Atlanta. Um, and the journey kind of kept going from there. You mentioned shame and when you were going into counseling. Mm -hmm. And that's a big subject and a pretty universal subject, especially for Christians mm -hmm. like me or anybody else out mm -hmm. there, where a lot of times we're tempted to feel shame about past things. You know, we've repented of it, mm -hmm. gotten past it, gone through counseling, mm -hmm. done all these things. But then 20 years later yeah. on a random night, uh, this is just hypothetical, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, no, no, no. Get 20, out of my life, man. Get 20, out of my life. Yeah. 20 years later, you like, you'll remember that yeah. on a random night and feel shame for it yeah. again. So after those events and after you kind of tried to escape, tried to cope in unhealthy ways, had fights with your wife, probably said a lot of things that you shouldn't have said. I should not have said. Yeah. yeah. How how do you forgive yourself mm -hmm. daily when you can't forget what you've done? Yeah. So um, shame is one of those things that I think the enemy uses in a major way that we um, consider but in a very subtle way, when I think we should consider it in a major way. Um, shame is what Adam did to Eve. Shame is what Satan did to him. Shame is what he tried to do to both of them um, to, to get them to move away from God's blessing. Um, I've, I've just learned there is, no, there is no shortcut from being honest with your own mind being honest with you, with the way you think and recognizing throughout the day, there are moments where you belittle or dismiss or think less of yourself or what you think or how you feel um, all in the hopes of approval, either from old voices, um, either from present voices or people and peers you, you end up pushing yourself in this, in this direction where you're kind of living out of the effort to make sure everybody else knows you're okay or feels okay with you. I've battled often that scenario of, yeah, I've, I've done some stuff I shouldn't have did, 
it's kind of embarrassing to talk about, I think. It's, it's kind of frustrating sometimes, but the shame kind of rises up a little bit. Um, but there's this verse in Romans um, chapter 2 that says, um, his goodness will lead us to repentance. The goodness of God to not only create us and then through Christ adopt us, but to know that through the work of Christ, I have relationship and continual access to him. Even in those moments that were bad, that he was, he was still there. He never left. He was present. He was real then as much as he was when he set me free from sin. Bro, that, that reality of his goodness moved me. The scriptures talk about every good and perfect gift comes from God. And, and I just, I, I imagine an eternity without him and that there is no good. An eternity without him where there is no gifts, no good, no, no enjoyment, no, no pleasure, just suffering. Um, and the little bit of the taste that I've had here on this side and to recognize his goodness holistically in my life when I look at my wife who's still here, when I look at my son, when I look at my, th my two other boys here, the fact that I'm still doing this music thing that <laughs> isn't coaching football and track, <laughs> um, there's goodness there. And that goodness humbles me enough to recognize my need of him and the, the dependence that should be there daily. So there's this repentance um, that comes from that. And it, it, what it did for me was it, it pushed God's truth to the forefront instead of my own, because in shame, you, you're, it's so easy to believe a lie about yourself, about other people. It's so easy to discredit the value that you have as an image bearer of God. And so I've just watched God use the moments of me recalling his goodness in my life um, and, and push through to that. Cause going through something, suffering, hardship, tragedy, and, and I mean, my situation sucks. It's, I never want anybody to ever have to go through that. Um, people, the phrase, I never wish that on my worst enemy. Like I never would, I would never want anyone to go through that. Um, but what I went through isn't <clears throat> the epitome of suffering. People suffer because they're bullied or they're teased, or because they have low self-esteem and they look down on themselves and they do it to themselves, self-inflicting wounds, or because they have you know, hard parents or ungodly parents, or because work sucks, or because sometimes somebody just cuts you off and <laughs> it ruins your day and you didn't know how to respond to it right. Um, the kids didn't turn out like you wanted them and now you gotta figure it out. Or, I mean, there's so many places where suffering exists in everyday living for people in this country. And then you go outside the U.S. and you start to see the, the disparity in poverty and wealth and the, the idea of people living in lack and the fact that you look at Puerto Rico and it still doesn't have clean water or you look at third world countries like South Sudan who's still fighting war and you just kind of realize there's suffering everywhere and, and mine is not the epitome of it. And if you're in it, it can blind you to the goodness that God has. Um, who was good enough to call you, to redeem you, good enough to keep you, who was good enough to be with you even if you didn't know he was in your suffering like he was with Jesus at the cross. And he's good enough even now. But it's just hard to see. But that goodness led me to repentance. That's awesome. Tadashi, Having you into the studio is a pleasure. Thank you. And your honesty, uh, the depth of conversation, we really, really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. So thank you for coming in. And thank you for making music that's real and as honest as this interview. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it.
Thanks for watching this episode of Can I Ask You Something? We know that as a Christian, you want to understand and love others better, but it can be hard to find biblical answers to the tough questions that get in the way. So in Can I Ask You Something, we listen with love to personal stories and expert opinions so that through their answers and through their wisdom, we can become more compassionate, more loving, and more confident as we follow Jesus. If you have a question or you're in a situation that's really difficult or maybe taboo, let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you around.